the Pollock twins. The Pollocks in Hexham, Northumberland, were an ordinary, everyday family. John and Florence adored their daughters, Joanna, 11, and Jacqueline, 6, and the two little girls were inseparable. On May 5th, 1957, while walking to church, the two sisters and their friend were struck by a car and killed. The little girls died almost instantly, and poor John and Florence were plunged into an unimaginable grief. Yet somehow, life had to go on, and in early 1958, Florence realized something wonderful. She was pregnant once again. John particularly felt that this pregnancy was special, different. He insisted Florence was carrying twin girls. Florence didn't believe him, and her skepticism seemed vindicated when doctors confirmed that she was only expecting one baby, not two. Yet John kept on insisting, and he was right. On the 4th of October, 1958, Florence gave birth to two twin girls, Jillian and Jennifer. Spookily, although the girls were identical, Jennifer had two birthmarks, one on the top of her nose, another on the left side of her waist. Just like six-year-old Jacqueline, she'd had a tiny birthmark on the left side of her waist and a scar on her forehead from when she'd fallen on a bucket at age three. Was Jennifer actually Jacqueline reborn? It seemed impossible to believe. When the twins were nine months old, they moved from the house of grief and tragedy, and in order to protect their young two daughters, the couple never spoke of Joanna and Jacqueline. Yet as the girls grew into lively toddlers, there were more eerie similarities. When their parents unpacked some old boxes, the twins recognized toys, other objects that had belonged to the big sisters. Joanna immediately knew the names of two of the dolls, then fished out Jacqueline's toys. Were they really sharing Jacqueline and Joanna's memories? The Tom and Shud Case. The Tom and Shud Case, also known as the Mystery of the Summerton Man, is an unsolved case of an unidentified man found dead at 6.30 a.m. on December 1, 1948, on Summerton Beach, South Australia. It is named after a phrase, Tamam Shud, meaning ended or finished, in Persian. Printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the fob pocket of the man's trousers, this scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Following a public appeal by police, the copy of the Rubaiyat from which the page had been torn was located. On the inside back cover of the book, detectives were able to read indentations from handwriting, a local telephone number, another un unidentified number, and a text that resembles an encrypted message. The text had not yet been deciphered. The case has been considered, since the early stages of police investigation, one of Australia's most profound mysteries. There has been intense speculation ever since regarding the identity of the victim, the cause of his death, and the events leading up to it. Public interest in this case remains significant for several reasons. The death occurring at a time of heightened international tensions, following the beginning of the Cold War, the apparent involvement of the secret code, the possible use of an undetectable poison, and the inability of authorities to identify the man. In addition to intense public interest in Australia during the late 1940s and early 1950s, the Tom and Shud case also attracted international attention. South Australia police consulted the counterparts overseas and distributed information about the dead man internationally in an effort to identify the man. International circulation of a photo of the man and details of his fingerprints yielded no positive identification. For example, in the United States, the FBI was unable to match the dead man's fingerprints with prints taken from files of domestic criminals. Scotland Yard was also asked to assist with the case, but could not offer any insights. Elisa Lam. The body of Elisa Lam, a Canadian student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, was recovered from a water tank atop the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles on February 19, 2013. She had been reported missing at the beginning of the month. Maintenance workers at the hotel discovered the body when investigating guests complained of problems with the water supply. Her disappearance had been widely reported. Interest had increased five days prior to her body's discovery when the LA Police Department released video of the last time she was known to have been seen, on the day of her disappearance by an elevator security camera. 
In the footage, Lom is seen exiting and re-entering the elevator, talking and gesturing in the hallway outside, and sometimes to hide within the elevator, which itself appears to be malfunctioning. The video went viral on the internet, with many viewers reporting that they found it a little unsettling. Explanations ranged from claims of paranormal involvement to the bipolar disorder from which Lom suffered. It has also been argued that the video was altered prior to release. The circumstances of Lom's death when she was found also raised questions, especially in light of the Cecil history in relation to other notable deaths and murders. Her body was naked, with most of her clothes and personal effects floating in the water near her. It took LA County Coroner Office four months after repeated delays to release the autopsy report, which reports no evidence of physical trauma and states that the cause of death was accidental. Guests of the Cecil Hotel sued the hotel over the incident and Lom's parents filed a separate suit later that year. The latter was dismissed in 2015. The Murder of Zygmunt Adamski At 3.30 on the afternoon of June 6th in 1980, 67-year-old Zygmunt sat out on foot to buy some potatoes from a nearby shop. As he left, he gave a cheery greeting to a neighbor. All seemed as it should be that summer afternoon. But Mr. Adamski was never seen alive again. And for five days, his whereabouts from that moment on remained a complete mystery. Five days later, on Wednesday, June 11th, his body was found lying on top of 12 feet of coal in a coal yard near a busy railway line at Todd Morden, a few miles away. He was found at 3.45 in the afternoon by the coal yard owner's son, Trevor Parker. The yard had last been used at 11 o'clock that morning, and Adamski's body must have been dumped there in the intervening four hours. Trevor Parker called the police and an officer, Alan Godfrey, arrived at the scene at 10 past four. On examination, it was found that Adamski had died of a heart attack. What compounded the mystery, though, were sinister burn marks on his neck and shoulders. There was a strange gel substance covering the burn marks. His clothes were in good condition, which seemed to rule out any idea that he had been living rough over the past five days. Mr. Adamski seemed to have been somewhat crudely redressed, if anything. He was wearing a coat, which was buttoned up the wrong way, and a vest, but no shirt, and his trousers weren't fastened properly, and neither were his shoes. Godfrey said at the time that it looked as though someone else had placed the shoes on Adamski's feet. No traces of coal dust were found on his clothing. Although he had been missing for five days, there was only one day's growth of beard on his face. He had eaten well, but not on the day he had died. It was said that it looked as though he had been dropped from above. The Death of Ricky McCormick on June 30th, 1999, a woman driving along Route 367 in eastern Missouri came across a partially decomposed body in a cornfield. Police knew the spot well. It was an area where bodies had been dumped before. This case, though, was different. Authorities used what remained of the body's fingerprints because decomposition had set in and the fingers were detached to identify the corpse. It belonged to 41-year-old Ricky McCormick that no one had reported McCormick missing and that no motive seemed to exist led authorities to rule out murder as a cause of death. Still, the case was highly mysterious. McCormick's body was found 15 miles away from his address. He didn't know how to drive and there was no public transit that could have brought him to the remote spot. The police focused on McCormick's background in trying to search for clues about his death. He was a high school dropout unemployed and unmarried and a father to four children. He'd served 11 months of a three-year sentence in jail on charges of statutory rape. Furthermore, he had last been seen alive five days earlier at a hospital in St. Louis. With such little information, no clear signs of assault, and no known enemies, the case eventually went cold. Then, 12 years after McCormick's body was discovered, something remarkable happened. The FBI officially classified the death as a homicide. As it turned out, there was more to the case than publicly previously known. The FBI's cryptanalysis and racketeering unit shared two eerie pieces of paper that had been found in Ricky's pocket at the time his body was discovered. 
On the scraps of paper were notes, but not in English, or any other language for that matter. The writing was incomprehensible, but the FBI believed it to be some kind of code that could hold the answer to Ricky's unknown death. While the notes were initially kept from the public, the FBI now reopened the case and released the mysterious notes in hopes that someone might be able to decode them. The Death of Dr. Gilbert Bogle and Margaret Chandler Dr. Gilbert Bogle was a physicist who worked at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. Married with several children, he was considered to be a brilliant scientist and had been a Rhodes Scholar. The police discovered that Bogle was also involved in relationships with other women, many of whom he took to parks. The coroner stood down a key female witness before she could give evidence to protect the families. Mrs. Chandler was married to Joffrey Chandler, who also worked in the same building as Dr. Bogle. They had two children. Witnesses later suggested that she may have been bored with her life and upset at her husband's fandering. Dr. Bogle, the Chandlers, and several others attended a barbecue just prior to Christmas 1962. On the way home, Mrs. Chandler told her husband that she was quite taken with Dr. Bogle. Mr. Chandler told the police that he and his wife had an understanding. He told her, if you want to take Gibb as a lover, it would make you happy. You do it. Dr. Bogle's body was discovered near Fuller's Bridge first by two youths searching for golf balls. They saw his body and presumed him to be drunk. When they returned an hour later to find that he had not moved and that his face had turned blue, they went to fetch help. When police arrived at the scene, they discovered that Bogle's body was half undressed. Somebody had placed his trousers over the back of his legs in such a way that he appeared to be dressed, but was not. A piece of carpet was also laid on top of his back underneath his jacket, which was laid perfectly on his back. Shortly after this, Mrs. Chandler's body was discovered a short distance away. She was also in a state of undress and her body had been covered with a broken up cardboard beer box. It was initially believed that she had covered Bogle's body first and then her own, but closer examination suggests that someone had covered her body as well. The case became celebrated because of the circumstances in which the bodies were found and because the cause of death could not be established. In 2006, a filmmaker discovered evidence to suggest the cause of death was hydrogen sulfide gas. In the early hours of January 1st, an eruption of gas from the polluted riverbed may have occurred, causing the noxious fumes to pull in deadly quantities in the grove.